Anybody else? Any testimony or anything before I get started? Don't feel inter- interrupt me anytime. Doesn't bother me. Okay. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 28. Okay. So the last three weeks, back up here a few weeks, we've been talking about the importance of evangelism. We've been talking about how important it truly is to us. And I don't believe we really understand its true importance until we're in the moments, like Marty just alluded to, when we know there's only one thing that's keeping us up, and it's Jesus. I think evangelism at those moments is what holds us through. So evangelism, by definition, just to kind of rewind here, the spreading of Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. So we all have been called to be a witness for Jesus. When we talk about our personal witness, that's our personal testimony, our personal opportunity that we were saved by grace. But the importance of evangelism, and again, I've said this once, I believe it though, is beyond even our deepest thoughts. When you think of the importance of evangelism, I think it is much deeper and broader than what we truly understand. And I believe that churches all over America today struggle with spreading the gospel to those that are not in their building. And I want you to think about that for a minute. You are the church, okay? This is a building. I was praying up here this morning and I thought, I had to remind myself, thank you for the church, but it's a building. But the members that make up the church is what will take evangelism and spread it. That, That is the only way the gospel is going to spread. If we take it outside of these four walls and we say, Jesus, this is all I want to do is share your gospel every opportunity I have. So over the last few weeks, we've talked about prayer and the value of starting with prayer. Okay? We, we should not only start with prayer, we should continue with prayer. We should continue with prayer until Jesus comes back. But it's important to start with prayer, when we, especially when we talk about witnessing to somebody. So the value in us being present was something we talked about in the lives of those around us, in our little world around. We've talked about that. And then last week, we talked about how we must actually proclaim the gospel. So we we can pray about it, we need to pray about it, we need to be present in people's lives. I've said it before, there's a guy at work, we work with 1,400 people across all shifts, it's all said and done, and he said, they may not want to hear about Jesus, but I'm going to tell you right now, if they're having a bad day or something's going on, they're going to find you who know Jesus, who's open about knowing Jesus, because they know that you have something they don't. That's what he told me, and I believe that, because it's funny we went to work the other day, and on our door, we, we try to be polite to everybody, because not everybody is that way. There was a note on our door, and it was from one of our supervisors, please pray for me. She didn't say any more. She just said, pray for me, and put her name on it. And we took time out of our day, each and every one of us. We didn't take time together, but me and my boss took time, and we prayed for that individual. She lost her grandma here recently. She's got several kids, and she's just got a lot going on. But I think we forget to be present in people's lives so often. So though it is important... To begin with prayer, it cannot just continue in prayer and prayer alone. Again, prayer is important, but if you just pray about it and it stops there, you've not spread the gospel. So it's important to pray and be in the lives of those around us, but if we're simply just there, we're not truly sharing the gospel yet again. I can be present in people's lives, and I've said that you can be a witness for Jesus without speaking about Jesus by how you treat people. But I believe to truly witness to people about Jesus, you've got to say that Jesus is the only way. We must combine these two too with the speaking of our Savior. So we have to talk about the good things that God's done for us. The blessed be his name things that even though we're going to go through the hard times, he's still got our back. So this morning, I'm going to get to my verses, I promise. (laughs) I believe a part of us each and every one of us is un- uncomfortable with this, persuasion. And, and you can say, well, I could argue with the best of it. Okay, I'm not talking about arguing with people, okay, but persuading people. So not only will you be required to speak about Jesus, but you will, may also have to be prepared to persuade them to find Jesus. So with all that being said, Acts chapter 28, if you would stand in honor of reading God's word, we're going to look at, at Paul here in, in Acts 20, chapter 28, and verse, starting in verse 23. And it says, After arranging a day with him, 
Many came to him at his lodging. From dawn to dusk, he expounded and witnessed about the kingdom of God. He tried to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. Some were persuaded by what he said, but others did not believe. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, God, as we just come to you again, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that we can open your book day in and day out, God, and we can see something that you're speaking directly to our hearts with, God. God, I just ask that through this message this morning, you would speak through it, God, that you would be shown to each and every one of us, God, and that we would have a fire, God, to go and witness to others about you and about the things that you've done, the things that you're continuing to do in our lives. God, I, I ask that you would just help us to be persuaded to share your gospel, God, that we would help spread your kingdom, God, and your love to this dark and, and dying world, God. God, I, got, I, I ask that you just clear our minds and our hearts right now of the problems that are going on around us, God, though they're completely real. God, I just ask that you help us to focus just on you and you alone for just this short time. God, I ask that you forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, and amen. Not only will you be required to speak about Jesus, but you may have to be prepared to persuade them to find Jesus. Now, I want you to think for just a minute. That maybe doesn't make sense to you. I want you to think about your life and when you accepted Jesus. I want you to go back to that time, if you can, and I pray that you can, that you found Jesus face-to-face in a saving relationship. And I want you to think, how did you get there? Can, can you go back to where you were when, when you knew you needed Jesus? I, I can remember, I was still going to Keene's as a little kid, when I first felt the need to be saved. And I don't know what stopped me. I didn't walk the aisle at Keene's. I waited several weeks and probably even months. And Easter Sunday of 2003, I remember it was like it was yesterday. I couldn't fight it anymore. I couldn't fight that I needed Jesus in my life why because somebody had persuaded me the reason i needed jesus so can you think back to when you held back from becoming a follower i kind of just shared that with you did you walk the aisle the first time god called you i guarantee 90 percent of us did not walk the aisle the first time god said hey you need to be a christian you need to know me in a saving relationship when we think about being persuaded to follow Jesus, each and every one of us can say, I had to be persuaded to follow Jesus. I've said it before, and I I believe it with all my heart. I've been saved almost 20 years, but I I believe with all my heart that I would not have got saved just because of the love of Jesus if the persuasion of what hell looked like had not been there. Sometimes it takes literally scaring hell into people for them to figure out that they need Jesus. And I know as terrible as that sounds, The world doesn't need any more darkness. But Satan is the ruler of this earth. And he will be the ruler of this earth until Jesus comes back on a white horse as king of kings and lord of lords. He's only going to come back one more time and he's going to call each and every one of us home to a home in glory with him. So if we're being honest, it took some time probably for us to follow Jesus. For me, it took several months. I, I can attest it took me several months To follow Jesus when I knew that I needed to be a a Christian. I want you to think this morning though, those that are are followers of Jesus, what what are you holding back from God today that he's still having to persuade you to give up, to do for him? So I talk about six months, maybe I was waited to become a, a Christian. I waited two years to do what I'm doing today because I did not want to do what God called me to do. God had to persuade me and through the lives of other people, that I came encounter with, they persuaded me in a Christian way, in a way that I knew God was calling me to do that. Each and every one of you can go to a time when you've been disobedient to God, that you've not done exactly what he called you to do, and he had to persuade you himself in some form or fashion. I, I believed in who he was. I'll talk about myself for a minute. I believed in who he was. I, I was in church as a little kid. I, I'd been to VBS. I went to all those things. I remember believing in, in who he was, but it didn't make him Lord of my life. There are people today, and I want, if you catch nothing else, catch this. There are people in your lives today that know who Jesus is, but don't know him. 
That there are people I know in my life that I've bought Bibles for, I've tried to mark certain pages for them, I've tried to speak in their lives, that they know who Jesus is, but they don't know him as Savior of their life. The world around us knows and they've heard of this Jesus character, right? I've talked about the, the guy I work with at church, or at work, I can't talk, that's an atheist. He, he knows who Jesus is though, he's heard about Jesus, but it doesn't mean he believes in him. Most, most of us, again, likely need to be persuaded. Annabelle started potty training yesterday, okay? Right now she has to be persuaded to go to the potty, okay? Sometimes she's decided to just go on the floor and do other things, and I won't go into detail on that. You can ask me later. I'll tell you all about it. And, but you have to persuade a child, and everybody that's been around children know you have to persuade them sometimes with something. Emily's got these little bitty stickers. There's a whole bunch on my door right now to the bathroom when she has actually gone and peed on the potty or whatever, that she gets a sticker, right? Kids are easy. If I could give everybody a sticker, they'd be happy. I'd be great, okay? I'd run out of stickers really quick, though. But most of us probably need persuasion just like that little child does. Most of us need a kick in the pants sometimes and say, hey, wake up, right? And whether you like that or not, it's a reality. I know for myself, as I've grown and and been in, in ministry, and I've, I've just been a Christian for 20 years, I could remember in high school especially, when I would do something, I would just feel God going, stupid, why aren't you listening to me? Some days I still feel that, okay? <laughs> but can I tell you something this morning? I think one of the numbers, this is my opinion, okay, so don't put money on this, but I believe one of the number one reasons people do not accept Jesus is due to the questions they have about Jesus, these questions are oftentimes roadblocks. One author I was reading, they said they were often roadblocks in front of them that simply need remove so they can embrace the gospel. How many people have you talked to and they, well, I'm a good person. Well, that's great. I'm glad you're a good person. But guess what? The Bible doesn't speak too highly of people that are just good people. Amen? It, it speaks of those who have been washed by the blood of Jesus. I want to tell you today, if you did 100% good 100% of the time, you're still a sinner, okay? There's something you did wrong. I'm not going to act like there's not. But you don't have Jesus. When you get to eternity, you're not going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You're going to hear, be gone, for I never knew you. That's the importance of the blood of Jesus. Without the blood, there's no entrance into the gates of eternity. In heaven, at least. There's a gate you're going to go through, but it's the gate of hell. And you're going to live in eternity there we always joke about certain things well that'll happen when hell freezes over hell's never going to freeze over okay satan, satan is the hell was designed for satan himself amen it was designed for satan who thought he was good enough to be god like god is if you know much about satan he was at once an angel okay think about that for a minute Think of being in the realm of God, with God, meeting him face to face, knowing Jesus before he was Jesus on earth, right? And still saying, well, I can do that too. <laughs> okay, let's see how that works. And we've seen it time and time again. So the first thing I really want you to look at in, in, in our verses here this morning, they will have questions. After arranging a day with them, many came to him in his lodging, from dawn to dusk, he expounded and witnessed about the kingdom of God. So if, if you look back in chapter 28, Paul's first interview with the Roman Jews is the verses right before where we started. And obviously they had questions because of the things he was preaching to them. If you look in the Jewish history, they believed in the Old Testament. They had the Old Testament with them. They knew the word in the Old Testament. But see, they don't think the way we think today i want you to catch this when we look at the old testament we see jesus time and time again because we've heard of jesus we've met jesus in a saving relationship but when they look back in the old testament they didn't have a jesus right until jesus walked this earth they didn't understand the things that he was doing were biblical and they were true but i will i, I said it once i'll say i can almost guarantee you that they will have questions Whoever you witness to. Well, how could a, a God love me? I, I've heard that one before. Well, what do you mean I'm not good enough to get into? You don't even know me. Well, I probably don't. But I know I'm not good enough, right? They, they include questions. Why can't other religions save me? 
We talk about world religions. I had a world religion, and I put it in quotes. We had, I had a world religion class when I was at Rin Lake. Just a class I had to take. I guess I was interested in some sort, I would have taken it. But you know, we talked about Christianity for like two days. <laughs> but we talked about every other religion that's a world religion for weeks at a time. And we'll tell you, there's only one way to eternity. It's not through religion. It's through Jesus. So if you're, if you're serving God as your religion, you're doing it all wrong. If you're going to church because, well, I'm a religious person. I, I, baloney, okay? Why is Jesus the only way? It's pretty simple, right? We make it hard, but he's the only one that died for us on a cross. That gave his blood for us that is so unworthy. But we don't feel the, the answer, I know. How can a loving God allow people to go to hell? I've heard that one before. Well, if God's so loving, why do people go to hell? Because we're all sinners in need of a Savior, right? We, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. It says that in Romans chapter 3. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Not a one of us in this room, not a one to come, no matter how young or how old, will ever be able to say, I am sinless and I don't need a Savior. Paul encountered people that had questions. They couldn't understand how someone could love them right where they are. Doesn't take long. You look at Paul's life before he was Paul, he was Saul. If somebody can love somebody that did what Saul did in murdering people and for their faith in Jesus, then he can love anybody. Amen? He, he can love anybody because he loved Saul enough to still speak into his life on the Damascus Road. This month, and everybody knows, I, I, I had my birthday earlier this month. I'm not a big fan of my birthday because of what it starts, okay? The month of June is Gay Pride Month. My birthday is June 1st. It's bothered me since I was in high school. I don't know why. But so often, I think we as Christians, we, we get labeled because we don't support them, and I'm not saying to support gay pride, okay? I'm not saying to support homosexuality. It's anti-biblical. But what I am saying is we've been labeled that we hate these people. And I want us to be mindful that they've got questions just like the rest of the world does. They're still in need of a Savior. And until we as Christians realize that, yeah, I don't agree with that person, but I still can pray for that person. The church is not going to grow. The church is going to continue to dwindle because they don't see us as loving people. I want you to think about that. We are the church. We're to love people. Not what they do. Been, I talked about Johnny Hunt a few weeks ago, and I agree 0%. If anything happened, I don't know all the facts, but if what they're saying happened and he abused this woman, I, ha I have no need for that. But he's still a human who needs Jesus in his life. I, I, don't, I don't care how many people you know that, well, they were a murderer. I, they still need Jesus in their life. If somebody has questions, we should be willing to listen to the questions. The second thing that I really want you to see is you need to have an answer. And I know that sounds like, wow, I have to have an answer. But I want to encourage you to use one saying. You know what? That's a good question. And I don't know the answer. But I'm going to find it for you. I want you to be encouraged to say, if, I, if you don't know the answer, don't make something up. Don't say, well, the Bible says blah, blah, blah. You have no idea if it says that or not. Okay? Don't, don't, don't go saying something that you have no idea what you're talking about. Tell them you don't know. I'm going to tell you right now, people have a lot more respect for you if you say, well, I don't know the answer, but I'll find it. I don't know. You may not know every answer. I don't care how many years you've been a Christian, you probably don't know every answer. And if you do, good for you, and we need to have a talk, okay, because I need to learn more. But it says in verse 23 that Paul expounded and witnessed about the kingdom of God. He continued to talk about God. He continued to tell them about the love that God had. Paul knew the word of God very well, as we can see in Scripture. He was being trained to be a Pharisee. He was very good at knowing the, the Old Testament. However, I still believe that he had to work to make it understandable to those he was speaking to. You ever been in church with a pastor that uses a bunch of big words? I don't know any big words, so you're not going to have that for me, okay? When we were at church in Evansville, our pastor, and we and him were friends, we still talked from time to time, he used a lot of big words. 
And I had a notebook, it's over there, that I had to write just that word in because I didn't know what the word meant. So I had to go home and look, what did that word mean? And then think back, what did he say in the context of that? We have to dumb it down sometimes, so to speak, for those that we're witnessing to. Everybody in this room has heard about the love of Jesus at some point. They may not understand how somebody can love them. Maybe you don't know the, the past that they've been through, but we have to make it understandable. So when these questions are asked, those asking them are looking for an answer that is genuine. They're not looking for some baloney that you pulled out of a hat and said, oh, here, I think this is the right answer. No, they're looking for a biblical response. Whether they know that or not, they're looking for an answer from the Bible. So if you don't know, tell them. If you aren't sure, tell them. Okay, just be honest. I want, I want you to think about being honest when we share the gospel with people. However, taking it a step further, don't just leave the question. You ever gone into Walmart, I'll give you an example, and, and somebody, you were talking to somebody you hadn't seen in a while, and they're telling you all the problems they got, well, I'll pray for you. How often do you go home and pray for that person? But if you were to take the time and pray right then and right there for them, you've done it, right? You're going to remember, I need to pray for that person again. I, I want you to think about that. When you think about somebody asking you a question, if I, if I tell somebody at work, hey, I'll go look it up, and they don't hear back from me for a week, they're not going to ask me another question because they don't respect me enough to give them an answer, or I don't respect them enough to give them an answer. However you want to look at that. So I want you to think about, if they have a question, you go look it up. Take your phone out and Google it. I don't care. Okay, whatever it takes. I, I have to do that sometime with Scripture. I'm looking for a certain Scripture, and I can't remember what it is. So I'll type verses on wisdom, verses on whatever I'm looking for. And sometimes that's how I feed myself the information. Go seek the Word of God. And once you find the answer that you feel is the right answer, go back to that person and tell them that. You need to have an answer for people. The Bible speaks very clearly in First or Second Peter. Again, uh, I think Caleb said it the other day. I don't, I, I don't know the, the road name. I know, I know what I'm talking about, but I don't know the road name. Or however Caleb says it, I don't know. But he told me that the other day. I don't know exactly where it's at. But the Bible says very clearly, it's marked, I'll have to look it up, that we should be prepared to speak about the joy that is in us because of Jesus. But it says the next part is to do it with gentleness and respect. We, we can persuade somebody by arguing with them, right? You go to a courtroom, they're going to argue about something, right? They're going to persuade the jury one way or the other. I want to tell you, Christian, this morning, we cannot persuade people by smacking them upside the head with the Bible, okay? You could try it, but I'm going to tell you right now, they're not going to ask you any more questions, okay? We have to persuade people with gentleness and love the way Jesus did. Yes, I know, Jesus flipped tables in the temple, okay? But all in all, Jesus wasn't somebody that just went around browbeating everybody, okay? Number three, and I'll, I'll close. It says in verse 24, some were persuaded by what he said, but others did not believe. So the third thing I want you to see, and I want you to, be, to not get discouraged by this, not all will be persuaded. Not everybody that you share the gospel with will come to know Jesus in a saving relationship. Don't be discouraged. If you have to go back to them again and again, don't, don't hesitate to do it. I've talked about a man before. His name was Kenny Greer. Okay? He was an elderly man. He was in his 90s. He passed away. I think he was 97 or 98. He, but he went to East Salem for, for decades. He was witnessed to by at least five pastors that I know of. And he didn't come to find Jesus until he was 95 years old. He met Jesus face to face a few years later. But you know what his response always was? Well, I'm just not ready yet. I, I'm just not ready yet. He was ex-military, been around the block a few times. Okay, he, was, he, he knew what was going on. But he was 95, he came to know Jesus. And they were planning to get him baptized and everything like that. And they were going to have to get a horse trough. They were going to do all these things. And he ended up passing away. But they knew without a doubt that he knew Jesus. Did it take a few years to persuade him? Yeah, it took several years to persuade him. I believe that Jesus had to work with the disciples to be the servants that they are. I believe that Jesus had to, to give a little with them sometimes and smack them upside the head and say, hey, why aren't you listening, right? And I believe that he never gave up on a single one of them. And I believe that even about Judas. 
I, I don't think Jesus ever gave up on Judas until Judas took his own life. I want you to think about that. If Judas would have came to Jesus or he just came back and said, God, forgive me for my, my shortcomings, he would have been accepted back into the fold, whether he sold Jesus out or not. And I love people that say, well, he had to die. No, Judas didn't have to die the way he died. Was he going to sell Jesus out? Somebody was going to, right? It may have been me or you if we'd been in the same situation. But I want to tell you that Peter sold him out too. P Peter sold Jesus out because he denied him three times, right? But I believe God had the same grace on Judas, or would have had the same grace on Judas that he did on Peter. But the Bible speaks very clearly that Judas went to his own place. Judas is in eternity right now in hell. He never truly knew Jesus. He knew Jesus, right? But he didn't know him as Lord of his life. If there's not a better example of that, I don't know why, that when, that, where there is one. Don't forget that prayer is a tool that should be used early and often throughout life. If you can't persuade somebody, don't just keep twisting their arm, okay? Go back to Jesus. Go back to God and say, God, help me. Some believed in Jesus through the message of Paul and some did not. I can't say it enough. There are going to be those in every situation. I, I want you to think the, cru the great crusades of Billy Graham, the thousands of people that would get saved. You think everybody in that room was saved after that? No. I, I don't think so because guess what? The next night, thousands more would be saved. I, I don't think there was ever a night when any preacher was preaching that everybody in the room was saved. I, I don't believe it today in churches. I don't care how small the church is. Some will believe when we speak to them. I'm dying up here. So, some, some are going to look at you and think you're crazy, okay? If you've ever witnessed very many times, you're going to know they're going to look at you like you're insane, okay? But we have to continue to seek Jesus' face. And say, God, help me persuade them today. Help me persuade them again. I'm going to ask Sheila and Carrie to come. We're going to close this morning. Paul continues in, in the later verses. And the, the Jews there are arguing amongst themselves. And he says that the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophet Isaiah to your ancestors. When he said, go to these people and say... You will listen and listen, yet never understand. You will look and look, yet never perceive. For the hearts of these people have grown callous. Their ears have heard a part of hearing. And they've shut their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and be converted, and I would heal them. And Paul continues, he said, Therefore let it be known to you that the saving work of God has been sent to the Gentiles, for they will listen. I want you to know today that if there's one in your life that maybe God's knocked on their door a couple times, he's going to quit knocking. I've had people disagree with me on that. God will quit knocking at some point. Because at some point, our life is going to end. And if he knocked once, that was our chance to accept him as our Savior. I'm going to ask that you stand this morning. I'm not going to keep you long. But I'm sure that verses in Isaiah really hurt the Jews' feelings that day when Paul shared it with them. Because they were still of hard hearing to what Jesus had done when he walked this earth. He did it in their midst, yet they still didn't believe. So I want you to think that the gospel is going to be harder to spread now than it was when Jesus walked this earth. Why? Because Jesus was here. Think of the disciples. I wish I could have been a disciple just because they had firsthand knowledge of Jesus. They got to hang out with Jesus for three, three and a half years. To be a fly on the wall on some of those meetings would have been amazing. But God is still in the saving business today if we would let him. If we would allow him to work through us. Heavenly Father, God, as we just come to you today, this time of invitation, God, I just ask that you would put a burden in our hearts, God. That we would lead somebody. That we'd be willing to get out of our comfort zone. And speak about you, God, in the hard times and in the easy times. God, in, in every opportunity that we have, every breath that it was in our lungs, God, you know, you know the exact time that our lives will end. You know those around us, God. You know they're, whether they're saved or not. 
And God, I ask that no matter how many years we have, that each one would be spent sharing the love of you and what you did for each and every one of us on the cross. Not that we would keep it for us, not that we would keep it for those that we like, God, that we would get out of the way and let each and every one find the cross and the blood that you spilled on it for us. God, help each and every one of us to persuade somebody that you are still in control of this eternity, God, and in the, the lives that we live. Though they may not be easy, God, that you're still in control. God, I ask that if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you, that they would find you in a saving relationship, God. That they would know without a doubt that you saved their life. And that when they pass from this earth, God, that they will meet you face to face. And God, that they will spend eternity in heaven with you because of their willingness to obey you, to accept you into their hearts. God, again, I ask in this time of invitation that your will would be done in each heart. In Jesus' name, and amen.